So, a joke. Got to start with a joke. Starts with a dying man. That's not very funny. So there's a man. He's a very good man. He's lived a very long life. And he's coming to the end of his life. And he knows that he's dying. So he's called on his priest. And his priest is ministering to him in his last moments. And he's a bit of a fire and brimstone priest. So he's saying to him, Denounce the devil! Denounce the devil! Let him really know what you think of his evil! And he's doing that thing like they do in the films where he holds up a cross. I've never seen anyone really do this, by the way. It's only in films. I've never done it. No. He holds up his cross. Denounce the devil! Let him know what you really think of his evil! The man says nothing. The priest is perturbed. Denounce the devil, let him know what you think of his evil. The man still says nothing. Denounce the devil, let him know what you think of his evil. Why are you not answering? And the man says, well, I know you're trying to help, but until I know where I'm heading, I'm not sure I should aggravate anybody. This is a view that a lot of people, I think, hold. They're not quite sure where they're heading. They haven't got a fixed view of what is going to happen to them. They aren't certain what comes after death. And they're not certain which way they'll go when that time comes. What about you? Are you sure? Do you know? Do you know it in your knower? Are you certain? We need a slide. I'll have to press a button. John writes in the last chapter of this epistle that we've been reading, chapter 5. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know. So that you may know that you have eternal life. He's written to us who believe. We believe. We believe in the name of the Son of God. And he's writing these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. I write these things that you may know that you have eternal life. I had a friend once called Trevor. Uh, he was a retired consultant surgeon. He was a very sweet man. He lived in Cumbria, which is where I served my curacy. We stayed in his house when I was on placement. I burnt his kettle. I didn't mean to. I thought it was a gas kettle. Do you know that goes, that you put on the oven? And it wasn't, it was electric. So I just kind of wandered in, put it on, put it on <laughs> walked out, and the, the kitchen just filled with smoke and little bits of black plastic. It was very embarrassing. He was very gracious about that. Trevor, and he was, he was a sweet man. He, when I asked him to explain to me what an obstetrician was, he blushed. And you think, you've you spent 40 years being an obstetrician, and you blush when you tell me. There you are. <clears throat> Lovely man, Trevor. He came to Christ powerfully as an adult in London in 1956, when in the church of Martin Lloyd-Jones, very famous guy. And he changed at that point, came to Christ. And they consciously discipled him. They taught him. They wanted him to understand the Lord and Savior he'd come to. They wanted him to be sure of the faith that he had taken on. So he was taught in 1956 these four memory verses, which he remembered. The first was assurance of salvation. 1 John 5, 11 to 12. That's in the passage we're reading this morning. He was taught this verse so that he would be sure 
of his salvation, that he would always be sure that he was saved, saved from death, saved from sin, saved from the devil, saved to the love of God, saved for eternal life. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. He was taught to be sure of God's provision. He was taught assurance of God's provision. And the memory verse was John 16, 24. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. God will provide for you. He was taught assurance of forgiveness. Again from 1 John, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God will forgive us if we confess our sins. He was taught assurance of victory from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but what, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So I met Trevor in 2002. He'd learnt these in 1956, and he still remembered them. It's a bit of a shame that memory verses have gone out of fashion a bit, isn't it? We shouldn't uh, allow that to happen. We should do this ourselves. He was consciously discipled. His church made sure that he had these building blocks for the future of his faith. No matter which church he went to, no matter where he moved, these blocks were put in place. And not all of us get that. It's a problem particularly in our denomination of the church, but it's a problem in lots of churches, that if somebody comes and sits in a pew, everybody assumes that they know more than them. Do you know, we all assume that everybody already has been taught everything, everybody knows everything, everybody is firm in their faith. And lots of us come into church just wondering. Lots of us come in hoping to find out. Some of us have come to church as children and we assume, oh, you learn everything you need to know in Sunday school. That'll do. It's one reason I think the Alpha Course has been so, uh, such a useful tool in the Anglican church because we've allowed so many people not to be told what it's all about, not to be properly discipled. But he was taught and this was fixed in him. And strong in there is assurance of salvation. These are the things every Christian should know, that we can be sure we are saved, that we can be sure that God will provide, that we can be sure of our forgiveness, that we should be sure of God's victory. Do you have that assurance? Are you sure of your salvation, of God's provision, of his willingness to forgive, of his final victory? Because lots of people don't want to be sure. Lots of people find surety just a little bit uncomfortable. It's very unpopular, particularly in the modern Western liberal world, to say you're sure. Because if you say you're sure, you're saying, I am certain this thing is right. Which means that this thing is wrong. And we do not like to tell people that they're wrong. We feel like maybe we're a bit more intellectual if we can just kind of say, I think maybe this might be the case. I think possibly as a weighing up of all the evidence that this might be my conclusion under these circumstances. I used to go into a lot of schools when I was in a country that allowed church ministers to go to schools. And uh, I used to go to religious education lessons and philosophy lessons. And this was taught to children that nobody was right that everybody was right. Everybody was a little bit wrong, and you could find truth by allowing everybody to hold what they believe. It didn't matter whether they were right or wrong, what mattered was that they believed it with their whole heart. It's, uh, I think, contributing to what we now call post-truth. Have you heard about post-truth? It's come from Kellyanne Conway, when she said that she had alternative facts. Now, that's probably, in a way, political trivia, do you know? 
whether we've got a media that's making fake news or we've got politicians that are twisting the truth. But I think it's based on something deeper and more significant, which is decades older, which is that we accept that there's no truth, that we no longer value truth, that we don't put truth on the pedestal we used to put it on where we cared for what would be true. The concept of being sure has become incredibly unpopular. It's even become unacceptable. If you say you're sure, then people can quickly say, aha, fundamentalist. No longer listen to him. We've described him as a fundamentalist that's out. Or worse, more horrifyingly, extremist. And once you're an extremist, puh, we don't want to know what you've got to say. And yet, to say all things can be right at the same time, to say everything is true and nothing is true, is surely woolly thinking. Some things are true. Something has to be right and something has to be wrong. Two opposite views cannot be right at the same time. Now, we can be humble about this. We can approach this humbly. We can say, I am sure and I am humble about this. I am sure because of this reason. We can be tolerant about this. I am sure, that doesn't mean I hate somebody that doesn't agree with me. I tolerate people who disagree with me. We can even say, and I accept I might be wrong. I accept I might have made a mistake, but I know that at the final tally, there will be right and there will be wrong. Something will turn out to be right and something else will turn out to be wrong. There either is a God or there isn't a God. Jesus either is God's son sent to save the world, the way, the truth, and the life, or Jesus is not God's son, the way, the truth, and the life. There is truth. We should value and cherish truth, and we should be searching for truth. But we cannot pretend somehow that everybody is right. And the more we continue to allow people to teach that everybody's right, that everything is relative, then the more we will see teenagers, young adults, and adults finding that they believe that life is meaningless, that life is pointless, that life is useless, and we'll find that people become more selfish and more cruel and more immature because what does it matter? It doesn't matter anyway. It's all meaningless. But life is not meaningless. Life is not useless. Life is an amazing adventure given to us by God. Jesus came that we should have life and have it to the full. Life is meaningful because there is truth, because we can be sure. And the truth is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The truth is that he who has the Son has life. Hold on. Won't that make us all intolerant if we say we're sure that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If we say that we will have a life because of Jesus? Well, this is the fun thing about Christianity. Christianity is all about truth. Christianity is all about tolerance. It's right there, right at the beginning. At the very beginning, Jesus taught tolerance. You can't get away from it. You can't sidestep it. If you come across an intolerant Christian, you need to tell them off. Jesus taught tolerance. He taught love your neighbor. He taught love your enemy. The parable of the prodigal son. That boy has utterly betrayed his dad. He's hurt him in the place it hurts most, in his wallet. He's taken his money, he's betrayed him, he's backstabbed him, he's run away, and he's come back. And Jesus commends this father for loving his son, for welcoming him back, for tolerating him, for accepting him, whatever his lifestyle had been, for accepting him after he'd taken his money, 
after he'd betrayed the family name, after he'd betrayed probably the family religion, he still accepted him. He still loved him. That is Jesus' example of the loving father. The parable of the good Samaritan. He loves a stranger. He shows mercy and compassion and love to a complete stranger of a different religion, of a different race, of a race that his people were supposed to hate. Jesus taught us to tolerate others, to love others. We are the fount of tolerance. Christianity should be where all the tolerant people are coming from. It may seem like a difficult balance when you look at the modern world, but we should be able to easily achieve this, that we can stand up for truth, for being certain of the truth, and that we will be tolerant and love. A genuine Christian will love those people who disagree. A genuine Christian will thirst for knowledge, because knowledge shows us more of God. A genuine Christian will be sure of their faith. And faith is not some woolly thing, which is how some people like to do it, you know. It's a little bit less than belief, or it's a, I don't really know, so I'll have to go on faith. I use faith as a crutch because I haven't got enough information. No. We're told in Hebrews, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Maybe we are hoping, maybe we do not see, but we are sure and we are certain. Faith is being sure and certain. And this passage that we read earlier, and the few verses before, because I like those as well, is about being sure of God's gift of salvation. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. That can get a bit convoluted. We might need to unpack it a bit. We believe in the son of God. We believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to us to reveal God to us, to teach us, to show us in his life and his teaching who God is, to die for us, to be raised for us, to redeem us, to save us. We believe in the son of God. We accept his testimony. And because of this, God has given us eternal life through his son. God gives us eternal life. And because of this, we should be sure. Because if we are not sure, we're making God out to be a liar. Now you can tell here, this is important, that John is speaking to believers. This could sound quite rude if you went up to a non-believer and just said these things to them, but also it wouldn't make sense. Hey, you're making God out to be a liar. Hang on, my point was that I don't believe in God. I'm not really offended that I've offended God if I don't believe in God. Do you know that kind of thing? You have to be a believer, but this is for us. For this to make sense, it has to be said to us, for us who have accepted the Son of God, for us who believe in the Son of God, John is saying it's possible for us to make God out to be a liar. And what he's saying to us is once you believe, you cannot pick and choose. You cannot pick out the bits you want. You cannot say, well, salvation sounds lovely. I like a bit of that, but this sin bit, you can keep that. I don't want the sin bit. You cannot say, well, I'm a Christian who's more into God and less into Jesus. I'm more into Jesus, less into God. I'm going to pick these parts. No, you cannot pick and choose. Because if we pick and choose, then what we're doing is listening to God, hearing from God, hearing what he has to say, And when we don't pick the bit he's saying, we are calling him a liar. There is no half belief possible here. This is really powerful stuff. There is no middle ground. There is no gray area. There's no room here for that kind of doubt. But we do. We do doubt, don't we? 
we occasionally have doubts. We wonder. We can be confused. We don't want to call God a liar, but how can we be sure? How can we be this certain? Nobody's seen God. How can we be certain he exists? Jesus lived a long time ago. How can we be sure what he said and what he did? What if it's all made up? Well, John gives us three pieces of evidence. Convoluted as well. The spirit, the water, and the blood. Here. See, it's before. I've been going backwards. Have you noticed? I thought we'd just look at the whole passage backwards just to make it more fun this morning. So, 1 John 5, verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. That clarifies everything, doesn't it? Now we're all sure and we can go home. This, this perplexed is, has perplexed Christians for thousands of years. And uh, the most um, understandable uh, explanation of why it still perplexes people is because John is dealing with a heresy at that time. So some of the phrases are not phrases we've used a lot in Christianity because the heresy went away. So therefore they stopped talking about these things because he says Jesus came by water and the blood and some, some people have tried to say, ah, oh, that's the sacraments. That's baptism and communion. But that would be very odd. That would be very unusual because it's not the way communion is described elsewhere. And how did Jesus come by water and the blood if the blood is the wine of communion or something like that? It's, it's confusing. Other people would say, it's most likely, and this is probably what's most likely, is he came, that he was acknowledged by God at his baptism by the water and then he shed his blood at his death. That it's, it's both those two strong, poignant moments in Jesus' life. It perplexes people, though. They're not quite sure about this water and the blood. And it's probably dealing with this heresy where these people were trying to say that Jesus and the Christ were two separate people. That Jesus was like this ordinary man. Let's not go into too much heresy. And then he joined with the Christ and they separated. And, and that's why it kind of, he's saying, no, this is not how it was. He came. Came by the water and the blood. Did not come by the water only, but by water and the blood. And it's the Spirit who testifies. But there are three that testify, and this is the bit that I think we should concentrate on this morning. The three that testify are the spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. I see this boiled down to physical and spiritual evidence. The water and the blood are the physical evidence. The spirit is the spiritual evidence. So the first part of physical evidence is creation, is the world we're in. It's a common experience for all people that they realize their existence and they wonder how existence could come to be. And for the colossal majority of every person who's ever been born, they ascribe their existence, their creation, to the divine. They look for a God who's made them. They want to understand how they can be, and they go to God. It's a very modern thing. It's a very Western thing that people have stopped realizing it is God who put them where they are. Creation is the physical evidence of our creator. The second physical evidence is Jesus' life a moment in history, a time in history that is attested to, that has witnesses. Jesus lived among us. Jesus revealed God to us. And we can realize God. If you give someone a gospel and ask them to read with an open mind, they should see God. They should see in the way Jesus lived. They should see in the way Jesus taught the reality of God. The gospels are evidence for Jesus. Jesus' life is physical evidence. And the last part is the spiritual evidence. And for me, this has been the clincher in my life. The spiritual evidence. I know that I have experienced the presence of God. I know that I have experienced the forgiveness and the love 
and the mercy of God. I know that I have experienced his joy and his peace. I have felt his spirit moving in me, in my life. This clinches the evidence for me. This is what testifies the spirit, the water, and the blood. And he says, God testifies to Jesus, that Jesus is his son. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Now, that might interest you because sometimes we think of Jesus as the evidence for God. We think Jesus is testifying to God, don't we? He does. Jesus testified to God. Jesus witnessed to God. Jesus is evidence for God. But Jesus' testimony would be worth nothing if God had not testified to Jesus. And we see that in Jesus' life. We see God speaking, saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. We see that in Jesus' life. We see God working in the miracles in Jesus' life. We see God working in the resurrection. God testifies to Jesus. Jesus is not the son of God because we want him to be. Jesus is not the Son of God because we've weighed up the evidence and we reckon it might be likely. Jesus is the Son of God because God tells us so. And God's testimony is far more potent than the testimony of man. I am sure that God has given us eternal life. I am sure that this life is in his son, that we receive this through his son. I am sure that he who has the son has life, and this gives all the meaning and truth to life that we need. Let's pray together. Father God, we do not want to call you a liar. Some here may still have doubt and confusion. Lord, you promise us assurance of salvation. Lord, would you speak to us now? Would you testify by your Spirit to each of us that we may be sure, that we may be certain, certain of your Son, certain of this gift of eternal life. Lord God, would you speak into our doubts, into our confusion, into our lives, and use us for the growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen.